Hi folks, and welcome to Muscle Tissue Part 2, where we look at the physiology of a muscle contraction. To understand the physiology, you really have to have a good grasp of the anatomy of the muscle. If you haven't taken the time to really learn the terminology of the, of the anatomy of the muscle tissue, then you better do that before you actually try to start tackling the physiology. It's not all that complicated, but if you don't know the terminology, you're really going to get confused very quickly. So where we're focusing is inside the muscle cell itself, the myofiber, and particularly down at the filament level. Remember that a bundle of filaments is called a myofibril. A myofibril is made up of a series of what are called sarcomeres. Within a sarcomere, bounded by Z-discs on either side, is everything a muscle fiber needs in order to contract completely. The simplest way to describe how a muscle fiber contracts is by using the sliding filament theory. The muscle contracts by actin and myosin sliding past one another. That's as simple as it gets. But let's add to that. The myosin forms cross bridges that attach to the actin. Down here on the right is the myosin molecule. The myosin has these projections called cross bridges. And these cross bridges have heads on them. These cross bridge heads are actually attracted to the actin molecule, represented by the long blue filament shown here. As the cross bridge is attached to the actin, they swivel and pull the actin over the myosin molecule. This increases the overlap of the filaments, resulting in a contraction of the muscle. So this picture is really just showing you the interaction between one myosin molecule and one actin molecule. But let's back out again and look at the sarcomere, where we have at least a few myosin molecules. These little projections here are their cross bridges, and then the actin molecule is here. Now, in this image right here, we see a relaxed muscle. The Z lines or Z discs are here. The A bands and the I bands are, cl are, are clearly visible. Now, as a muscle contracts, the Z lines are going to be drawn together because the actin is being pulled and slid over the myosin molecules. You'll see that the actin is attached to the Z discs, which really are proteins that hold it all together. Notice that the I bands are getting shorter. When the muscle is completely contracted, the I bands are all but gone. Now, know this, that the actin and myosin filaments don't shorten at all, and the A band does not change. It's just that the I band shortens as the filaments overlap one another. The entire sarcomere shortens, and this happens within the entire myofiber. Every single sarcomere goes through the same process. And as that happens, the entire myofibril shortens and thickens or contracts. Now, how is this all controlled? Well, in order to understand that, we've got to look back at the neuron, part of the nervous system. Nerves control muscles. Let's review a little bit of the anatomy of a neuron. Here's the cell body with the nucleus on the inside. And out here are dendrites. These dendrites receive information from other neurons. This neuron here is, in particular, is a motor neuron, so it receives its message from other neurons. Other neurons would signal these dendrites, which would cause this neuron to send a message to the muscle fibers. Once the dendrites receive a message from the central nervous system, the message can be conducted along the axon down to the muscle fiber. We'll learn more about axon anatomy later. The message travels all the way down here to the synaptic end bulbs, which is where the neuron actually communicates with the muscle fiber. Now a new term called the motor unit. A motor unit is simply a motor neuron, which we just described, in all the myofibers it innervates. A single muscle, such as the biceps in your arm, is made up of several hundred motor units. In fact, the average number of motor units for a typical bicep is around 750 to 800 motor units. We need to know a little bit about how a neuron actually works. That is, how does it send its signal to a, a muscle fiber? Nearly all types of neurons, whether they're motor neurons or sensory neurons or neurons inside the brain, they all work the same way. They have what's called a resting membrane potential. 
This is a voltage across their membrane. And it's called a resting membrane potential because when the neuron is not doing anything, in other words, resting, it's maintaining this voltage. To understand how a neuron actually gets this voltage, we you have to look at the membrane of a neuron. If this is the membrane, this is the inside of the neuron and this is the outside. Within the membrane are these specialized proteins called sodium potassium pumps. They're an active pump, therefore they use some ATP to actively pump sodium out of the cell and pump potassium in. What happens is that you've got a a higher concentration of sodium on the outside than on the inside. What this sets up is a gradient. Because there's so much sodium on the outside relative to the amount of potassium on the inside, the outside of the membrane takes on a positive charge while the very inside of the membrane remains a negative charge. As long as the sodium potassium pump keeps this up, this voltage is maintained across the membrane until a stimulus comes along. The stimulus could be a message from another neuron. The stimulus causes what are called voltage-gated ion channels to open. During the resting membrane potential, these proteins that would, other that would otherwise allow sodium to get in are closed, maintaining the positive charge on the outside of the membrane known as the resting membrane potential. A stimulus can come along and actually cause this little gate to open up and allow the sodium to flow in. When that happens, it depolarizes the membrane. That is, it reverses the charges on the outside. It's no longer positive. It's now negative and positive on the inside. That's known as a depolarization. What's just happened now is that a nerve impulse has started. So the flow, inflow of sodium depolarizes the membrane and that impulse propagates all the way down the axon until it reaches the synaptic end bulbs. There, the synaptic end bulbs release a chemical, a neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is what's going to stimulate the muscle fibers to contract. Now for a little bit more anatomy. We're going to look down here at the level of a myofiber and where the neuron actually comes in and attaches. If you look here at a little cross-section of the synaptic end bulbs, you'll see this little vesicles actually in this picture actively releasing the, ch the chemical neurotransmitter acetylcholine into this space. What you see here is the sarcolemma in an indentation that receives the synaptic end bulb. This junction between the neuron and the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. You'll see that inside the axon terminal are some mitochondria because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to get these vesicles to the, to the membrane surface in order to release the chemical acetylcholine. What you also see here is in, are these are tubes. These are passageways from the sarcolemma, these are pores in the sarcolemma that go deep inside the muscle fiber itself and they're called transverse tubules or called or T-tubules for short. The synaptic end bulb and the muscle fiber don't actually touch. There's a space in between called the synaptic cleft and that portion of the muscle fiber on the sarcolemma has acetylcholine receptors that initiate what's known as the action potential of a muscle fiber. Now to add something else to the anatomy down at the myofibril level is something known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the SR for short. This sarcoplasmic reticulum is synonymous with the smoothie R in any cell. In this case it stores calcium. Calcium ions are really necessary. Calcium ions are necessary for the contraction of muscle. So each myofibril has stored around it a complete supply of calcium. In order for the muscle to contract, that calcium needs to be released so that it can interact with the actin and myosin inside the filaments. And then for the muscle to relax, the calcium needs to be reabsorbed into the SR. So a little bit more detail about a muscle contraction. To add a little bit more detail to your knowledge of the muscle contraction other than just the sliding filament theory, you should be able to describe the following steps. 
Here at the neuromuscular junction, a signal from the neuron reaches the axon terminal, and acetylcholine is released. Acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma are activated, and then the muscle cell gets into what's known as an excited state. The excitation travels all along the sarcolemma and down deep into the muscle fiber by way of these T-tubules. That stimulus reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then releases the calcium. The calcium activates the sliding filament process and then the muscles contract. I'm expecting you to know these steps in a little bit more detail and perhaps you could practice describing it by using diagrams and labeling it. By using some step-by-step -step diagrams and perhaps labeling it. Here's another view and animation that might help you out. Again, you've got a muscle fiber and it's myofibrils on the inside made up of the actin and myosin. You can even see the small little sarcomeres inside in series. You also see the sarcoplasmic reticulum surrounding each one of the myofibrils and then the T-tubules which start with these little pores that are really just extensions of the that are just extensions of the sarcolemma deep inside the myofiber so that when a muscle fiber gets stimulated the stimulation occurs over the cell membrane and is carried deep within the muscle fiber around the myofibrils. The process starts here at the synaptic end bulb releasing acetylcholine. The acetylcholine de depolarizes or excites the muscle cell and that stimulus is carried deep within the muscle fiber by way of the T-tubules causing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium which is represented by these black diamonds. To understand what happens next, we have to go down to the level of the actin and myosin. So here's one large myosin molecule with its cross bridges. It's got some ATP attached. And in the gold beads here is the actin. Now, here's introduced a new protein that's actually covering the actin. It's called troponin tropomyosin. Together, it's the troponin tropomyosin complex. What it's doing here is it's actually keeping the, the myosin cross bridges from attaching themselves to the actin. It acts like a chaperone. This keeps the myosin from interacting with the actin molecule and allows the muscle cell to stay relaxed. When calcium is released into the space from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium interacts with the troponin causing it to change shape and therefore exposing the binding sites on the actin. Then the myosin cross bridges go to work by attaching and swiveling in a particular direction, all in the same direction, moving the actin molecule over the myosin molecule. This causes a shortening and thickening of the sarcomere in the entire muscle fiber itself. Almost immediately when the calcium is released, it's reabsorbed back into the SR. When that happens, the troponin tropomyosin moves back into place. The myosin cross bridges let go of the actin, and the actin molecule slides back into place, allowing for relaxation. Well, that's a lot to absorb in one screencast, so I'm going to quit here, but I hope you don't. Please take some time to allow this to sink in. Watch the video a few times, bring any questions to class and be confident that you can actually learn this. We'll see you back in class. Pump up the jam, pump it up, while your feet are stumping. And the jam is pumping, look ahead, the crowd is jumping. Pump it up a little more, get the party going on the dance floor.